Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, let me prepare myself here by cracking open my drink. All right. I am consuming uh, one in the Sour series of beers, the Sours by Japaz, which is Japanese Brazilian female brewing company. Uh, and it's a sour ale with raspberry and blackberry. And now you know, just in case you were wondering. Uh, so I'm going to read The Moon Moth by Jack Vance today. Um, it's about 30 to 40 pages. Uh, I might finish, I might not. We'll find out. Um, <laughs> what I've got here image-wise is by... Well, it's, it's by Humayun Ibrahim. Uh, he did the illustration for a graphic novel version of The Moon Moth that is just, like, stunningly beautiful. Um, but yeah, we'll get to the scene in the book soon. I'm gonna just wait a couple minutes and then I'll get started. Oh, also, uh, we're listening to Takashi Kokubo, who, uh, gave me permission to use a variety of his albums. Uh, he's one of my favorite ambient musicians from the 90s in Japan, uh, still making stuff today. Very soothing. Uh, look, he knows what he's about. <laughs> okay, let's get down to business, I think. Now let me just adjust some shit. All right, cool. <clears throat> All right, this is The Moon Moth by Jack Vance. Make sure this isn't too loud. Okay. The houseboat had been built to the most exacting standards of Cyrenese craftsmanship, which is to say as close to the absolute as human eye could detect. The planking of waxy dark wood showed no joints, the fastenings were platinum rivets, countersunk, and polished flat. In style, the boat was massive, broad-beamed, steady as the shore itself, without ponderosity or slackness of line. The bow bulged like a swan's breast, the stem rising high, then crooking forward to support an iron lantern. The doors were carved from slabs of a mottled black-green wood, the windows were many-sectioned, paned with squares of mica, stained rose, blue, pale green, and violet. The bow was given to service facilities, I'm sorry, the bow was given to service facilities, and quarters for the slaves. Amidships were a pair of sleeping cabins, a dining saloon, and a parlor saloon, opening upon an observation deck at the stern. Such was Edward Thistle's houseboat, but ownership brought him neither pleasure nor pride. The houseboat had become shabby, the carpeting had lost its pile, the carved screens were chipped, the iron lantern at the bow sagged with rust. Seventy years ago, the first owner, on accepting the boat, had honored the builder and had been likewise honored. The transaction, for the process represented a great deal more than simple giving and taking, had augmented the prestige of both. That time was far gone. The houseboat now commanded no prestige whatsoever. Edward Thistle, resident on Cyrene only three months, recognized the lack, but could do nothing about it. This particular houseboat was the best he could get. He sat on the rear deck, practicing the ganga, a zither-like instrument not much larger than his hand. A hundred yards inshore, surf to find a strip of white beach. Beyond rose the jungle, with a silhouette of craggy black hills against the sky. Mirel shone hazy and white overhead, as if through a tangle of spiderweb. The face of the ocean pooled and puddled with mother-of-pearl luster. The scene had become as familiar, though not as boring, as the Ganga, at which he worked for two hours, twinging out the Cyrenese scales, forming chords, traversing simple progressions. Now he put down the Ganga for the Zachinko. This, a small sound box studded with keys, played with the right hand. Pressure on the keys forced air through reeds in the keys themselves, producing a concertina-like tone. Concertina? I've never been sure about how to pronounce that word. Thistle ran off a dozen quick scales, making very few mistakes. 
Of the six instruments he had set himself to learn, the Zachinko had proved the least refractory, with the exception, of course, of the Heimerkin, that clacking, slapping, clattering device of wood and stone used exclusively with the slaves. Thistle practiced another ten minutes, then put aside the Zachinko. He flexed his arms, wrung his aching fingers. Every waking moment since his arrival had been given to the instruments, the Heimerkin, the Ganga, the Zachinko, the Kiv, the Strapan, the Gomapard. He had practiced scales in 19 keys and four modes, chords without number, intervals never imagined on the home planets. Trills, arpeggios, slurs, click stops, and nasalizations, damping and augmentation of overtones, vibratos and wolf tones, concavities and convexities. He practiced with a dogged, deadly diligence, in which his original concept of music as a source of pleasure had long become lost. Looking over the instruments, Thistle resisted an urge to fling all six into the Titanic. He rose to his feet, went forward through the parlor saloon, the dining saloon, along a corridor past the galley, and came out on the foredeck. He bent over the rail, peered down into the underwater pens where Toby and Rex, the slaves, were harnessing the drayfish for the weekly trip to Fawn, eight miles north. The youngest fish, either playful or captious, ducked and plunged. Its streaming black muzzle broke water, and Thistle, looking into its face, felt a peculiar qualm. The fish wore no mask. Thistle laughed uneasily, fingering his own mask, the moon moth. No question about it, he was becoming acclimated to Cyrene. A significant stage had been reached when the naked face of a fish caused him shock. The fish were finally harnessed, Toby and Rex climbed aboard, red bodies glistening, black cloth masks clinging to their faces. Ignoring Thistle, they stowed the pen, hoisted the anchor. The drayfish strained, the harness tautened, the houseboat moved north. Returning to the afterdeck, Thistle took up the strapon. This, a circular sound box, eight inches in diameter. Forty-six wires radiated from a central hub to the circumference, where they connected to either a bell or a tinkle bar. When plucked, the bells rang, the bars chimed. When strung, the <laughs> when strummed, the instrument gave off a twanging, jingling sound. When played with competence, the pleasantly acid dissonances produced an expressive effect. In an unskilled hand, the results were less felicitous and might even approach random noise. I'm gonna turn the music down just a tad bit. <clears throat> The strapan was Thistle's weakest instrument, and he practiced with concentration during the entire trip north. In due course, the houseboat approached the floating city. The drayfish were curbed, the houseboat warped to a mooring. Along the dock, a line of idlers weighed and gauged every aspect of the houseboat, the slaves and Thistle himself, according to Cyrene's habit. Thistle, not yet accustomed to all the m <coughs> pardon. Thistle, not yet accustomed to such penetrating inspection, found the scrutiny unsettling, all the more so for the immobility of the masks. Self-consciously adjusting his own moon moth, he climbed the ladder to the dock. A slave rose from where he had been squatting, touched knuckles to the black cloth at his forehead, and sang on a three-tone phrase of interrogation. The moon moth before me possibly expresses the identity of Sir Edward Thistle. Thistle tapped the Heimerkin, which hung at his belt, and sang, I am Sir Thistle. I have been honored by a trust, sang the slave. Three days from dawn to dusk I have waited on the dock. Three nights from dusk to dawn I have crouched on a raft below the same dock, listening to the feet of the nightmen. At last I behold the mask of Sir Thistle. Thistle evoked an impatient clatter from the Heimerkin. What is the nature of this trust? I carry a message, Sir Thistle. It is intended for you. Thistle held out his left hand, playing the Heimerkin with his right. Give me the message. Instantly, Sir Thistle. The message bore a heavy superscription. Emergency communication. Rush. Thistle ripped open the envelope. The message was signed by Castel Cromartin, chief executive of the Interworld Policies Board. And after the formal salutation read... Absolutely urgent the following orders be executed. Aboard Carino Cruzero, destination Fawn, date of arrival January 10th UT, is a notorious assassin, Haxo Angmark. Meet landing with adequate authority, effect detention and incarceration of this man. These instructions must be successfully implemented. Failure is unacceptable. 
Attention! Haxo Angmark is superlatively dangerous. Kill him without hesitation at any show of resistance. Thistle considered the message with dismay. In coming to Fan as consular representative, he had expected nothing like this. He felt neither inclination nor competence in the matter of dealing with dangerous assassins. Thoughtfully, he rubbed the fuzzy gray cheek of his mask. The situation was not completely dark. Esteban Rolver, director of the spaceport, would doubtless cooperate and perhaps furnish a platoon of slaves. More hopefully, Thistle reread the message. January 10th, Universal Time. He consulted a, conversa a conversion calendar. Today, 40th of the season of Bitter Nectar, Thistle ran his finger down the column, stopped. January 10th. Today. A distant rumble caught his attention. Dropping from the mist came a dull shape, the lighter returning from contact with Karina Cruzero. Thistle once more reread the note, raised his head, studied the descending lighter. Aboard would be Haxo Angmark. In five minutes, he would emerge upon the soil of Cyrene. Landing formalities would detain him possibly twenty minutes. The landing field lay a mile and a half distant, joined to the fan by a winding path through the hills. Thistle turned to the slave. When did this message arrive? The slave leaned forward, uncomprehendingly. Thistle reiterated his question, singing to the clack of the Heimerkin. This message, you have enjoyed the honor of its custody how long? The slave sang... Long days have I waited on the wharf, retreating only to the raft at the onset of dusk. Now my vigil is rewarded. I behold, Sir Thistle. Thistle turned away, walked furiously up the dock. Ineffective, inefficient sirenes. Why had they not delivered the message to his houseboat? Twenty-five minutes. Twenty-two now. At the esplanade, Thistle stopped, looked right, then left, hoping for a miracle some sort of air transport to whisk him to the spaceport where, with Rolver's aid, Haxo Angmark might still be detained. Or better yet, a second message cancelling the first. Something. Anything. But air cars were not to be found on Cyrene, and no second message appeared. Across the esplanade rose a meager row of permanent structures, built of stone and iron and so proof against the efforts of the nightmen. A hostler occupied one of these structures, and as Thistle watched, a man in a splendid pearl and silver mask emerged riding one of the lizard-like mounts of Cyrene. Thistle sprang forward. There was still time. With luck, he might yet intercept Haxo Angmark. He hurried across the esplanade. Before the line of stalls stood the hostler, inspecting his stalk with solicitude, occasionally burnishing a scale or whisking away an insect. There were five of the beasts in prime condition, each as tall as a man's shoulder, with massive legs, thick bodies, heavy wedge-shaped heads. From their forefangs, which had been artificially lengthened and curved into near circles, gold rings depended. The scales of each had been stained in diaper pattern, purple and green, orange and black, red and blue, brown and pink, yellow and silver. Thistle came to a breathless halt in front of the hostler. He reached for his kiv. Ah, there's a footnote here. Let's read. Jack Vance can be especially fond of footnotes when it comes to his cultures. <clears throat> kiv. Five banks of resilient metal strips, 14 to the bank, played by touching, twisting, and twanging. <laughs> Thank you, Jack Vance. He reached for his kiv, then hesitated. Could this be considered a casual, personal encounter? The Zachinko, perhaps. But the statement of his needs hardly seemed to demand the formal approach. Better the kiv, after all. He struck a chord, but by error found himself stroking the ganga. Beneath his mask, Thistle grinned apologetically. His relationship with this hostler was by no means on an intimate basis. He hoped that the hostler was of sanguine disposition, and in any event, the urgency of the occasion allowed no time to select an exactly appropriate instrument. He struck a second chord, and playing as well... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He struck a second chord and, playing as well as agitation, breathlessness, and lack of skill allowed, sang out a request. Sir Hostler, I have immediate need of a swift mount. Allow me to select from your herd. The Hostler wore a mask of considerable complexity, which Thistle could not identify. A construction of varnished brown cloth, pleated gray leather, and high on the forehead, two large green and scarlet globes, minutely segmented like insect eyes. 
He inspected Thistle a long moment, then, rather ostentatiously selecting his stomach, executed a brilliant progression of trills and rounds of an import Thistle failed to grasp. Footnote for the stomach. <clears throat> stomach, rather, not stomach. Stomach. Three flute-like tubes equipped with plungers. Thumb and forefinger squeeze a bag to force air across the mouthpieces. The second, third, and fourth little fingers manipulate the slide. The stomach is an instrument well adapted to the sentiments of cool withdrawal or even disapproval. The hostler sang, Sir Moon Moth, I fear that my steeds are unsuitable to a person of your distinction. Thistle earnestly twanged at the Ganga. By no means, they all seem adequate. I am in great haste and will gladly accept any of the group. The hostler played a brittle, cascading crescendo. Sir Moon Moth, he sang, the steeds are ill and dirty. I am flattered that you consider them adequate to your use. I cannot accept the merit you offer me. And, here, switching instruments, he struck a cool tinkle from his crotach. Somehow I fail to recognize the boon companion and co-craftsman who accosts me so familiarly with his ganga. The implication was clear. Thistle would receive no mount. He turned, set off at a run for the landing field. Behind him sounded a clatter of the hostler's heimerkin. Whether directed toward the hostler's slaves or toward himself, Thistle did not pause to learn. Ah, the crotach. A small square sound box strung with resined gut. The musician stretches the strings with his fingernail or strokes them with his fingertips to produce a variety of quietly formal sounds. The crotach is also used as an instrument of insult. Ho oh ho! Get told, Thistle. <clears throat> this is very quiet music. The previous consular representative of the home planets on Cyrene had been killed at Zundar. Masked as a tavern bravo, he had accosted a girl beribboned for the equinoctial attitudes, a solecism for which he had been instantly beheaded by a red demiurge, a sun sprite, and a magic hornet. Edward Thessel, recently graduated from the Institute, had been named his successor and allowed three days to prepare himself. Normally of a contemplative, even cautious, disposition, Thistle had regarded the appointment as a challenge. He learned the Cyrenese language by subcerebral techniques and found it uncomplicated. Then, in the Journal of Universal Anthropology, he read, <clears throat> The population of the Titanic littoral is highly individualistic, possibly in response to a bountiful environment which puts no premium upon group activity. The language reflecting this trait expresses the individual's mood, his emotional attitude toward a given situation. Factual information is regarded as a secondary co-committant. Moreover, the language is sung, characteristically to the accompaniment of a small instrument. As a result, there is great difficulty in ascertaining fact from a native of Fan or the forbidden city Zundar. One will be regaled with elegant arias and demonstrations of astonishing virtuosity upon one or another of the numerous musical instruments. The visitor to this fascinating world, unless he cares to be treated with the most consummate contempt, must therefore learn to express himself after the approved local fashion. Thistle made a note in his memorandum book. Procure small musical instruments together with directions as to use. He read on. There is everywhere and at all times a plenitude, not to say superfluity, of food and the climate is benign. With a fund of racial energy and a great deal of leisure time, the population occupies itself with intricacy. Intricacy in all things, intricate craftsmanship such as the carved panels which adorn the houseboats, intricate symbolism as exemplified in the masks worn by everyone. The intricate half-musical language, which admirably expresses subtle moods and emotions, and above all, the fantastic intricacy of interpersonal relationships, prestige, face, mana, repute, glory. The Cyrenese word is strock. Every man has his characteristic strock, which determines whether, <clears throat> which determines whether, when he needs a houseboat, he will be urged to avail himself of a floating palace rich with gems, alabaster, lanterns, peacock faience, and carved wood, or grudgingly permit in an abandoned shack on a raft. There is no medium of exchange on Cyrene. The single and sole currency is strock. Thistle rubbed his chin and read further. Masks are worn at all times in accordance with the philosophy that a man should not be compelled to use a similitude foisted upon him by factors beyond his control, that he should be at liberty to choose that semblance most consonant with his struck. 
In the civilized areas of Cyrene, which is to say the titanic littoral, a man literally never shows his face. It is his most basic secret. Gambling, by this token, is unknown on Cyrene. It would be catastrophic to Cyrene's self-respect to gain advantage by means other than the exercise of strock. The word luck has no counterpart in the Cyrenese language. I'm going to mess with the music a bit. It's quite quiet. <clears throat> Thistle rubbed his chin and read further. Masks are worn at all times. Oh, wait. I already read this. <laughs> Thistle made another note. Get mask. Museum? Drama guild? He finished the article, hastened forth to complete his preparations, and the next day embarked aboard the Robert Astrogard for the first leg of the passage to Cyrene. The lighter settled upon the Cyrenese spaceport, a topaz disc isolated among the black, green, and purple hills. The lighter grounded, and Edward Thistle stepped forth. He was met by Esteban Rolver, the local agent for Spaceways. Rolver threw up his hands, stepped back. Uh, stepped back. Your mask! He cried huskily. Where is your mask? Thistle held it up rather self-consciously. I, I wasn't sure. Put it on, said Rolver, turning away. He himself wore a fabrication of dull green scales, blue lacquered wood. Black quills protruded at the cheeks, and under his chin hung a black and white checkered pom-pom, the total effect creating a sense of sardonic, supple personality. Thistle adjusted the mask to his face, undecided whether to make a joke about the situation or to maintain a reserve suitable to the dignity of his post. "'Are you masked?' Rolver inquired over his shoulder. Thistle replied in the affirmative, and Rolver turned. The mask hid the expression of his face, but his hand unconsciously flicked a set of keys strapped to his thigh. The instrument sounded a trill of shock and polite consternation. "'You can't wear that mask,' saying Rolver. "'In fact, how? where did you get it?' "'It's copied from a mask owned by the Polypolis Museum,' Thistle declared stiffly. "'I'm sure it's authentic.' Rolver nodded, his own mask seeming more sardonic than ever. "'It's authentic enough.' It's a variant of the type known as the Sea Dragon Conqueror, and is worn on ceremonial occasions by persons of enormous prestige, princes, heroes, master craftsmen, great musicians. I wasn't aware. Rolver made a gesture of languid understanding. It's something you'll learn in due course. Notice my mask. Today I'm wearing a tarn bird. Persons of minimal prestige, such as you, I, any other outworlder, wear this sort of thing. Odd, said Thistle, as they started across the field toward a low, concrete blockhouse. I assumed that the person wore whatever he liked. Certainly, said Rolver. Wear any mask you like, if you can make it stick. This tarn bird, for instance, I wear it to indicate that I presume nothing. I make no claims to wisdom, ferocity, versatility, musicianship, truculence, or any of a dozen other Cyrenese virtues. For the sake of argument, said Thistle, what would happen if I walked through the streets of Zondar in this mask? Rolver laughed, a muffled sound behind his mask. If you walked along the docks of Zondar, there are no streets. In any mask, you'd be killed within the hour. That's what happened to Benko, your predecessor. He didn't know how to act. None of us outworlders know how to act. In Fan, we're tolerated, so long as we keep our place. But you couldn't even walk around Fan in that regalia you're sporting now. Somebody wearing a fire snake or a thunder goblin, masks you understand, would step up to you. He'd play his Krodach, and if you failed to challenge his audacity with a passage on the Skarani, a devilish instrument, he'd play his Heimerkin, the instrument we use with the slaves. That's the ultimate expression of contempt. Or he might ring his dueling gong and attack you, then and there. Ah, uh, footnote for the Skarani. Skarani, a miniature bagpipe, the sack squeezed between thumb and palm, the four fingers controlling the stops along the tubes. I had no idea that people here were quite so irascible, said Thistle in a subdued voice. Rolver shrugged and swung open the massive steel door into his office. Certain acts may not be committed on the concourse at Polypolis without incurring criticism. Yes, that's quite true, said Thistle. He looked around the office. Why the security, the concrete, the steel? Protection against the savages, said Rolver. They come down from the mountains at night, steal what's available, kill anyone they find ashore. He went to a closet, brought forth a mask. 
Here, use this moon moth. It won't get you in trouble. Thistle unenthusiastically inspected the mask. It was constructed of mouse-colored fur. There was a tuft of hair at each side of the mouth hole, a pair of feather-like antennae at the forehead. White lace flaps dangled beside the temples, and under the eyes hung a series of red folds, creating an effect at once lugubrious and comic. Thistle asked, Does this mask signify any degree of prestige? Not a great deal. Well, after all, I am consular representative, said Thistle. I represent the home planets, a hundred billion people. If the home planets want their representative to wear a Sea Dragon Conqueror mask, they'd better send out a Sea Dragon Conqueror type of a man. I see, said Thistle in a subdued voice. Well, if I must. Rolver politely averted his gaze while Thistle doffed the Sea Dragon Conqueror and slipped the more modest Moon Moth over his head. I suppose I can find something just a bit more suitable in one of the shops, Thistle said. I'm told a person simply goes in and takes what he needs. Correct. Rolver surveyed Thistle critically. That mask, temporarily at least, is perfectly suitable. And it's rather important not to take anything from the shops until you know the Strock value of the article you want. The owner loses prestige if a person of low Strock makes free with his best work. Thistle shook his head in exasperation. Nothing of this was explained to me. I knew of the masks, of course, and the painstaking integrity of the craftsmen, but this insistence on prestige, struck, whatever the word is. Uh, no matter, said Rolver. After a year or two, you'll begin to learn your way around. I suppose you speak the language. Oh, indeed, certainly. And what instruments do you play? Well, I was given to understand that any small instrument was adequate, or that I could merely sing. Mm, very inaccurate. Only slaves sing without accompaniment. I suggest that you learn the following instruments as quickly as possible. The Heimerkin for your slaves, the Ganga for conversation between intimates or one a trifle lower than yourself in Strak, the Kiv for casual polite intercourse, the Zechinko for more formal dealings, the Strapan or the Krodach for your social inferiors, in your case should you wish to insult someone, the Gomapard or the double Kamenthil for ceremonials. He considered a moment. The Cerebaran, the Waterloot, and the Slobo are highly useful also, but perhaps you'd better learn the other instruments first. Uh, they should provide at least a rudimentary means of communication. Aren't you exaggerating, suggested Thistle, or joking? Rolver laughed his Saturnine laugh. <laughs> Not at all. First of all, you'll need a houseboat, and then you'll want slaves. I'm going to take a moment here to pause. Okay. <clears throat> Rolver took Thistle from the landing field to the docks of Fawn, a walk of an hour and a half along a pleasant path under enormous trees loaded with fruit, cereal pods, sacks of sugary sap. At the moment, said Rolver, there are only four outworlders in Fan, counting yourself. I'll take you to Velibus, our commercial factor. I think he's got an old houseboat he might let you use. Cornelie Velibus had resided fifteen years in Fan, acquiring sufficient strock to wear his South Wind mask with authority. This consisted of a blue disc inlaid with cabocons of, lap of lapis lazuli, surrounded by an aureole of shimmering snakeskin. Hardier and more cordial than Rolver, he not only provided Thistle with a houseboat, but also a score of various musical instruments and a pair of slaves. Embarrassed by the largesse, Thistle stammered something about payment, but Velibus cut him off with an expansive gesture. My dear fellow, this is Cyrene. Such trifles cost nothing. But a houseboat? Velibus played a courtly little flourish on his kiv. I'll be frank, Sir Thistle. The boat is old and a trifle shabby. I can't afford to use it. My status would suffer. A graceful melody accompanied his words. Status as yet need not concern you. You require merely shelter, comfort, and safety from the nightmen. Nightmen? The cannibals who roam the shore after dark. Ah, yes, Sir Rover mentioned them. Ah, oh, horrible things. We won't discuss them. A shuddering little trill issued from his kiv. Now, as to slaves. He tapped the blue disc of his mask with a thoughtful forefinger. 
Rex and Toby should serve you well. He raised his voice, played a swift clatter on the Heimerkin. Avon Estrobu! A female slave appeared, wearing a dozen tight bands of pink cloth and a dainty black mask sparkling with mother-of-pearl sequins. Fosu et Rex, I Toby! Rex and Toby appeared, wearing loose masks of black cloth, russet jerkins. Wellibus addressed them with a resonant clatter of Heimerkin, enjoining them to the service of their new master, on pain, oh, sorry, on pain of return to their native islands. They prostrated themselves, saying pledges of servitude to Thistle. In a, <clears throat> let me restart here, I had to turn down the music a bit for my own self. <laughs> They prostrated themselves and sang pledges of servitude to Thistle in husky voices. Thistle laughed nervously and essayed a sentence in the Sirenese language. Go to the houseboat, clean it well, bring aboard food. Toby and Rex stared blankly through the holes in their masks. Velibus repeated the orders with the Heimerkin accompaniment. The slaves bowed and departed. Thistle surveyed the musical instruments with dismay. I haven't the slightest idea how to go about learning these things. Velibus turned to Rolver. What about Kershaw? Could he be persuaded to give Sir Thistle some basic instruction? Rolver nodded judiciously. Kershaw might undertake the job. Thistle asked, Who is Kershaw? The fourth of our little group of expatriates, replied Velibus. An anthropologist. You've read, um, uh, Zundar, the Splendid, Rituals of Cyrene, The Faceless Foe. No? Not pity. All excellent works. Kershaw is high in prestige, and I believe visits Zundar from time to time. Wears a cave owl, sometimes a star wanderer, or even a wise arbiter. He's taken to an equatorial serpent, said Rolver, the variant with the gilt tusks. Indeed, marveled Velibus. Well, I must say he's earned it. A fine fellow, a good chap indeed. And he strummed his zachinko thoughtfully. Three months passed. Under the tutelage of Matthew Kershaw, Thistle practiced the Heimerkin, the Ganga, the Strapan, the Kiv, the Gomapard, and the Zachinko, the Double Camethil, the Krodach, and the Slobo, the Waterloot, a number of others could wait, said Kershaw, until Thistle had mastered the six most basic instruments. He lent Thistle recordings of noteworthy Sirenese, conversing in various moods and to various accompaniments, so that Thistle might learn the melodic conventions currently in vogue and perfect himself in the niceties of intonation, the various rhythms, cross rhythms, compound rhythms, implied rhythms, and suppressed rhythms. Kershaw professed to find Sirenese music a fascinating study, and Thistle admitted that it was a subject not readily exhausted. The quarter-tone tuning of the instruments admitted the use of 24 tonalities. Jesus, that's a lot. Sorry. <laughs> the quarter-tone the quarter -tone tuning of the instruments admitted the use of 24 tonalities, which multiplied by the five modes in general use, resulted in 124 separate scales. Kershaw, however, advised that Thistle primarily concentrate on learning each instrument in its fundamental tonality, using only two of the modes. Just going to check ahead real quick, see how many pages we got left. Hmm, quite a few. I think I'll read the next couple paragraphs and maybe we'll call it there for now and finish it tomorrow. <clears throat> With no immediate business at Fawn except the weekly visits to Matthew Kershaw, Thistle took his houseboat eight miles south and moored it in the lee of a rocky promontory. Here, if it had not been for the incessant practicing, Thistle lived an idyllic life. The sea was calm and crystal clear, the beach, ringed by the gray, green, and purple foliage of the forest, lay close at hand if he wanted to stretch his legs. Toby and Rex occupied a pair of cubicles forward. Thistle had the after-cabins to himself. From time to time, he toyed with the idea of a third slave, possibly a young female, to contribute an element of charm and gaiety to the menage, but Kershaw advised against the step, fearing that the intensity of Thistle's concentration might somehow be diminished. Thistle acquiesced and devoted himself to the study of the six instruments. The days passed quickly. Thistle never became bored with the pageantry of dawn and sunset, the white clouds and blue sea of noon, the night sky blazing with the 29 stars of cluster SI-1715. The weekly trip to Fan broke the tedium. Toby and Rex foraged for food. Thistle visited the luxurious houseboat of Matthew Kershaw for instruction and advice. 
Then, three months after Thistle's arrival, came the message completely disorganizing the routine. Haxo Angmark, assassin, agent provocateur, ruthless and crafty criminal, had come to Cyrene. Effective detention and incarceration of this man, read the orders. Attention! Haxo Angmark, superlatively dangerous. Kill without hesitation. And we'll pause there for now. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, if you did. Um, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow probably to finish the story. The Moon Moth is one of my favorite shorts by Jack Vance. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying it, uh, or you folks are enjoying it. And if you are, uh, I recommend taking a look into the graphic novel. Like I said, um, the art uh, of, let me look up the guy's name again. Uh, Humayun Ibrahim is stunning and lends itself incredibly well to the sort of uh, cultural melange that Jack Vance creates in this story. Um, but yeah, I'll see you all tomorrow and thanks for hanging.